We're continuing our series in the book of Samuel. We're the 13th part of it, and we ain't gotten tired of it yet. Hallelujah. We're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 12 today. If you want to go ahead and find that, 2 Samuel chapter 12. As we're turning to 2 Samuel 12, I want to read a passage from Ezekiel 18 real quick. In Ezekiel 18, starting in verse 21, it says, But if a wicked person turns away from all his sins that he's committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of the transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him. For the righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live. Pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. Lord, thank you for a fantastic time of worship and of special music this morning. Thank you for giving us the ability to praise you in song. Uh, Lord, I, I ask that, Holy Spirit, as we're here and we're opening the Word of God, as we've been refreshed with the beautiful music, that, that as we approach your Word and your throne, that you would be the one speaking, Holy Spirit, that I would simply be the voice in which you use, that you would cut to the heart our hearts and through our minds, that you would change us, you would conform us to the image of the Son. There is nothing greater than when a sinner repents, when, when we, even as believers, Believers, when we fall and we repent, Lord, I ask that you would grant us the ability to walk in that posture of repentance towards you today, that you would help us as we journey through life and we journey through sanctification, that we would be quick to repent and quick to turn from our sin as we're going to see here in this passage. Lord, thank you for all the many blessings you've given us and for your son and his sacrifice, giving us the ability to repent, to have a way that we can be made right with our creator. In Jesus' name, amen. The last couple times when we've been going through uh, First and Second Samuel, the, the key individual that we've been following is David, who became King David. Uh, we first kind of see him in the spotlight as he's anointed by Samuel, even though all of his brothers aren't. Uh, we see him come into the public spotlight as he trusts in God and he uh, slays Goliath with the power of the Lord. We see him grow in popularity uh, because he's very successful in battle. And the scripture tells us it's because the Lord was going before him. The Lord was winning his battles. We've seen him flee from Saul. We've seen all of these things. And we think, rah, rah, David, you're the hero of the story. But if you were here the last time we were here, uh, he is most definitely not a hero in the story. Uh, David falls in a magnificently terrible way. He not only uh, fails to live up to the office of king and go out to war, but because of that initial failure in his office and the way he was called, to, the job he was told to conduct, because of that failure, he falls into adultery. Uh, I wouldn't even say falls. I'd say he runs headlong into adultery. And because of that adultery, a, a child is conceived and in an effort to hide his sin and to hide the sin of the woman, he decides he's going to bring the man home and lie to him him that it's his child. He is honorable enough that he sleeps in the dirt like his troops are back that are fighting in the war. And because of his honor, David decides to kill him. So not only is David an adulterer, but also a murderer. And that's the last place that we left him, seeing how easily that we can fall. And we're going to be picking up in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel. But before we get to the text, who here just absolutely loves to be corrected when they're wrong? There's a lot of silence right now. We've got one hand. That's it. No one loves correction, right? Who, who, who here uh, loves it when you're in a debate or an argument over something and you're absolutely positive that you are right, that what you're saying is true, and you get very clearly defeated and proven that you're wrong? No one does. I certainly do not enjoy that. I like to think I'm a semi-intelligent human being. And there are things in my life that I have thought were absolute facts that turned out to be a bunch of hogwash. And I have fought for those things and said that this is true, this thing happened, or whatever it may be, and been very much incorrect. This is one of the reasons why, why I do not uh, enjoy mathematics, uh, because I'm always being told I'm wrong. I, I can do math really well. I can put numbers on a page, symbols. I can even throw some letters in there. Um, but it's usually wrong when I do it. So the, the, there are things in, in life that, that we think we have a knowledge of, that we understand, that, that we've got a grasp of, but in reality, we can be confronted with the fact that we are wrong. 
And no one enjoys correction, especially people, those of us who have any minutia of pride within us, we don't enjoy that correction. There are times when correction is needed and, and we're gracious to receive it, but most of the time, it's not fun. It's a humbling experience to be corrected when we're wrong. And even in those cases when we're proven wrong, with absolute no shadow of a doubt that we're wrong, we will still try to weasel our way out of being halfway right. This usually takes place in the context of marriage. My wife's in the nursery. I can say what I want. I fought for a point, and I, I, I get to the point, and I just turn, it turns into an outright lie because, like, oh, well, you didn't explain that factor into it. So, yeah, if, if we're taking that into consideration, then, yeah, you're right. I was only halfway wrong. There's no such thing as halfway wrong, okay? You're wrong or you're right. There's no middle ground between that. It's true or it's a lie. And so we'll, we'll even in that sense attempt to save our own dignity and pride because no one wants to be wrong. Uh, our pride is especially wounded when we have to admit and then fix error. It's one thing to be told that you're wrong. It's another thing to then have to swallow your pride and correct yourself or correct the action that you're in. That's not an enjoyable experience. This is where we're at with King David. He failed to live up to his role. He sinned greatly. And now we're at a point that's critical in his life. Because if we are following side by side the lives of Saul, the, his predecessor, and the life of David, they both have very muchly messed up. In fact, most of us will probably say David has messed up so much worse than Saul did. Saul just didn't wait for Samuel to do a sacrifice. A couple other things that we might think, well, that's not a big deal. Why do you do that? But if we're told what David did, and we're not told it was King David from the Bible who did it, we'd go, kill him. He deserves to die. we go, that's, that's King David, the one who, hard after God, you know. Uh, oh, man. So we're going to look today at what it is that David is doing and the response that's going to happen. So chapter 12, starting in verse 1, immediately where we left off last time, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. But the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had brought up. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. He used to eat of the morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. And it was like a daughter to him. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And I want to stop right here real quick. We've, we've seen Nathan show up before in the text when we talked about uh, David's desire to build a dwelling place for God. And God says, no, I'm going to build you a house and establish you and your descendants as the, on the throne forever as king. Uh, Nathan is the, the prophet in the story at this point. We no longer have Samuel in this story. We have Nathan now. And so Nathan is the one who's interacting with David, who's delivering to him the words of God as they're supposed to be carried out. And and Nathan is very much aware of this situation at this point. And we see the story that he's telling of the one poor person with one ewe lamb who treated it like one of the family and the rich man who had so many lambs, but he just didn't want to get rid of one of his own to feed a guest. Then we go back to the text and David's response after hearing this says, Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives... The man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. God is telling Nathan to confront David with a parable of sorts because of David's sin. But the thing is, is David doesn't realize it's a parable at the time. David thinks Nathan is reporting on an actual event that has happened. And in a way, metaphorically, he is. He's describing what David has done. But David himself thinks this is an event that's happened in his kingdom and he's so upset over this tra travesty that this person would steal this one lamb from these poor people. They just had this one lamb. They weren't even eating that lamb. They were treating it like a member of the family. And the man who had many, who had the ability to get more even if he wanted to, he's a rich man, stole it from him. At this point we go, man, David's pretty dense. He's not picking up what's being put down here. 
But I don't think it's that David's dense. I think David is blind to the fact of the egregious nature of the sin that he's committed. And we too can fall into this blindness with our own sin. Usually it's the point of a habitual sin that we fall into as believers or non-believers where we're committing a sin on such a regular basis and it it fulfills our flesh so greatly that we'll refuse to acknowledge the fact that what I am doing is a sin against God. That this thing that I'm engaging in is egregious in the sight of God. And usually the way that 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 forms where, where it becomes where we're being so dense we don't realize what we're doing is we start justifying to ourselves our actions. Well, this isn't that big of a deal because of this circumstance or that circumstance. This isn't that big of a, of a problem or of a sin because, you know, I'm going through this thing in my life. Now, if someone other than me was doing this, it would be a big deal. But because of my circumstances or because of things that are happening in my job or the way that my marriage is going or whatever it may be, then it's okay for me. And that doesn't happen overnight. David didn't just wake up one day and said, you know what, I'm going to commit adultery and murder. Good husbands and good wives don't wake up one day and say, I'm going to commit adultery against my spouse. Very slowly, just as we see with David, he failed to do one thing. He failed to go to war. And then from that point, just an immediate downhill. And the same thing happens with us. And usually the first step after sinful action begins to take place is justification of our own actions. This isn't that bad because blank. This doesn't apply to me because of blank. And we become blinded to what the Word of God says. The Scripture makes that very clear. Not not only are are people who are not justified blinded to the realities of God and and are not enlightened to to experience the Holy Spirit inside of them and and see the the wickedness of their own ways until the point of, of regeneration and repentance, but as believers, we can do the exact same thing to ourselves and we're giving into the flesh so greatly that the Spirit is silenced. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation, uh, this has happened several times to me where you're at a public place and someone uh, just, I don't know how, they don't realize that headphones have been invented and they're blasting their music as absolutely loud as humanly possible. No one's ever been there, right? Park, having a picnic with your family and all of a sudden Jay-Z joins you. (laughs) And it's annoying, sure. But where I usually go is I am going to rebel so much against you forcing your terrible music on me that I am then going to play my music as loud as I can to try to fix the situation. And since I do not own a Bluetooth speaker, I literally have to just turn on my phone and like hold it right here to try to drown it out. Usually what ends up happening is it sounds like Jay-Z and Kenny Chesney are getting in a fist fight. Is not a more enjoyable experience. When, when, the, when the flesh is being fed, it can very muchly overpower the sound that the Spirit is trying to speak to us. Very easily. Especially if we're, we're slowly drifting away from the Spirit and don't even realize our condition until we fall into a sinful situation or into a habit of sin. And at that point, it doesn't matter how close to your ear, you're going to hold it and turn it up. The flesh is going to be so much louder. So we don't even realize the sin that we're falling into or the egregious nature of that sin. But in this story that's, that's happening here, the same thing happens to us all the time because of our blindness to our own sin. The Holy Spirit will place in our path a story maybe familiar or even dissimilar to even our own or place a situation in our lives where we can gawk and look down our nose and go, oh, that person is just terrible. I cannot believe that they would do this particular thing or this particular sin or have this particular deal happen to them. Why would they do such a thing? And over and over and over again, I've realized it in my life, and certainly I know other people have realized it in theirs, that when the Holy Spirit finally gets a hold of them, slaps them around a little bit, wakes them up, and they go, I'm that guy. I'm that guy who's doing that thing. My outrage over it was not the fact that I was so righteous that I couldn't stand that they were doing it. It's that my flesh had become so puffed up that I became more elevated and better than them and I can get away with it. I can do that sin because I'm me. Because of my circumstance. Because of my situation. I deserve to be sinful. We don't articulate it that way, but that's the way it plays out. That's the way it actually practically works out in our life. 
So Nathan is delivering this truth and this story to David with three parts, a kind of a judicial action. And I want us to break those things down. The first is the indictment that he's giving, or the charge, if you will. The sentence is that being is going to be carried out by God is the next thing. And then David is going to address the judge. And after David's address, the sentence is further intensified. So pick up in verse 7 here. After David is upset and saying, we need to find this man, hunt him down, kill him, make him pay back fourfold what he did before we do that even, Nathan says to David, you are the man. You are the one you're disgusted by. The Spirit, if we are paying attention, if we're walking in the Spirit instead of the flesh, or when we get that moment of clarity where the Spirit's screaming, wake up, and we realize that I am that man. That's what's going through his mind right here. He continues, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. Notice whenever God gives an indictment or a command or anything like that, the, the prelude to the Ten Commandments, he reminds the people who he is. He says, I am the Lord your God. I am Yahweh who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, the Ten Commandments. In the indictment, he does the same thing, that I am the one who anointed you king. I'm the one who protected you when Saul was coming after you. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? God has done so much for David up to this point in his life. David was a smelly shepherd kid, the youngest of his family, wasn't even going to get an inheritance probably. And then he's anointed as king and he's, he's given the opportunity to face Goliath and he has this faith that's enormous within him. He's called a man after God's own heart, all of these things. He, he becomes successful in battle to the point that there's peace in the land during his reign, something that never happens in ancient history. But his actions are basically the same thing when we continually sin after we've been saved by the grace of God and we say, God, that's really nice that you did that for me. You saved my eternal soul. You've given me peace with my Creator, but I'm going to do what I want. Do we ever just sit and think and dwell about what it is that Christ has done for us? That God would send His own Son, the second member of the Trinity, God incarnate in the flesh to, very first of all, be born in a hay barn. That's no place for a king to be born. That's no place a king should even step foot in. To walk amongst this sinful world with its sinful people and its sinful actions and, and all of those things, being a holy God and living amongst us, and on top of that, being completely perfect and holy in all of His ways. And then not just that, that he says, Scripture says, goes joyfully to the cross. That he would choose to die a physical death for a singular purpose. That those people who war and rebel and fight against him would be redeemed. But God, I don't particularly like that you said this is a sin, so I'm just going to do it. The arrogance of putting ourselves on the throne of God's place in our hearts and saying that's great that you've saved me but I'm going to do my own thing that's great I've been justified but I'd rather sin too that cannot be continuing on you have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Am Amorites now we get to the charge that's going to be brought the, uh, the, the indictment of the sentence that's handed down, verse 10. The punishment for, for David acting in this way, he says, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house. Why was, why was David getting in trouble in the first place? He didn't go to war. He didn't do his job. His job involved using the sword in that sense. And so then the punishment that God gives him is, you will never again have a moment of that in this life. The sword will always be in your house. And as we continue through 2 Samuel, we'll see very much so how that plays out. That until David's dying day, he goes back to the condition where he was, where he was running and fleeing, and his life was constantly threatened. 
because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife, thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. You shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And he takes the sin that David has committed against him. And he says, not only will it be done back to you, but it will not be secret. It will be a very public thing. And David has a response it, it, almost in the middle, he, he, it's almost as if he cuts him off because Nathan continues to say what God's punishment is. David responds in verse 13. He said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. What just happened? David understands where he is before God. He understands he has sinned against the holy God. He understands that he has gone off the way in which he's supposed to be walking. He has repented. But there's still more. And as we pointed out in Ezekiel, when we opened up, Nathan is like, you shall not die. You've repented of your sin. Nevertheless, he continues, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. In his sin, he conceived a child, and God is going to take that child away. Then Nathan went to his house. David's child dies and the Lord afflicts the child that Uriah's wife bore to David. David's address to God, his repentance, his act of repenting of his sin, let's be very clear, there are, there are two things happening here. David is absolutely forgiven of that sin. Nathan even tells him in the very Old Testament way that it's put in Ezekiel, you're not going to die because of this. You've repented. But at the same time that God completely forgives and wipes clean David of that sin, there are real earthly consequences to his sin. And a lot of times people will mix up and confuse the, the, the idea of forgiveness, especially those outside of the faith, uh, when, when, when they sin against believers and we get upset about it. Who would have thought you'd be upset if you sin against me? Say, well, you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to be forgiving, so you can't punish me. Catch 22, gotcha. That's not, how, that's not how God works. I absolutely will forgive you if it is needed to be forgiven of. You absolutely will be forgiven of God when you go before His throne and ask for that forgiveness. But that does not mean the earthly temporary consequences of sin are removed from it. I think it's a beautiful picture of the gospel when there are people in prison who have committed horrible crimes, even terrible crimes, even on death row, if they have genuine repentance and come to Christ. I've seen uh, particular Bible teachers who will have conferences there, and some of these prisoners, I mean, they're sitting in a cell all day, what else are they going to do, are so knowledgeable about theology and all of these things, but they don't go to the front desk and say, hey, I'm a, I'm a Christian now, you've got to let me go. And then the same thing with our own sin, especially egregious sins against each other. There are real earthly consequences. God absolutely forgives, but there are absolutely consequences to our sin. And in this case here with David, God himself is delivering those consequences. Here's what's going to happen, David, because of your sin. This, this, and this. You are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven but that doesn't mean the earthly consequences are wiped away. And as believers, when we err, when we sin, we can fully expect when we repent, we have a genuine repentance. Repentance, the, the, the word that, that's used there, it, it basically translates of a, of a turning away, a changing of the mind. 180 degree way of I was walking this way, I'm now walking the other direction. If there's true, genuine repentance, you are forgiven. End of story. But if true, genuine sin has taken place, there's absolutely consequences that need to be dealt with. This is why it's so important. Yes, repentance is very beautiful and amazing and awesome, but let's not forget 
that there is plenty of time that David had to repent before he got to this spot. So much heartache throughout the rest of 2 Samuel. This is not a bright, fuzzy book the rest of the way through. From this point on, it is a very dark and bloody and vicious book. David had every opportunity over and over and over again to repent. As the army was leaving, he could have said, man, what am I doing? I can just TiVo that show. I don't need to stay and watch it. I'll go out with the army. He could have seen that young woman bathing on a roof and gone, whoa, I don't need to be doing that. Gone back inside. He could have confessed to Uriah the way he sinned against him. He didn't do that either. And the same thing the Lord does with us, He provides a way to escape and to be restored. And Scripture tells us that, but our flesh tells us, well, if you just cover that up with this and then cover that with this, you'll be okay. And then we have 36 tiny band-aids on top of a four-inch wide hole with 10,000 PSI behind it. I don't repair tanks for a living. That doesn't sound like a good idea. And the consequences of our, our sins in an earthly sense will be carried out. This is another one of those times, especially because of the depth and the seriousness of what's happening here. Well, people will point to this and say, well, the, the, God of the, the God of the Old Testament, as if there's two of them, is such a terrible and violent and evil person. He's going to kill his kid. He's going to say there's going to be violence all through his house. What a wicked God. I like the New Testament God better. That tells me one thing very clearly when I hear that argument, and I hope you don't ever use that argument, because that argument tells me you have never read the Bible. You don't have a clue what it says. Because just as much wrath and, and all these things that we see in the Old Testament or we see in passages like this that, that seem harsh, it's just as present in the New. And the love and the grace and the mercy that we see in the New, it is just as present in the Old. Keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, God had every right to wipe David off the face of the earth the second he committed that sin. But in his mercy, he did not. And the same goes for every single one of us. The gospel that calls us to repent and believe, the gospel that calls us to repent and turn from our sin, that, that God would even allow such a thing, it, it is both offensive and it is scandalous. It's offensive because we don't like to be wrong or told that we're wrong or have to fess up to our mistakes or try to correct it. But on the opposite extreme of it, it is scandalous because we absolutely do not deserve that grace, that mercy, that love, or for Christ to ever come to rescue us. If we are willing to humble ourselves before a mighty God and say, yes, I have sinned and I must repent, then we get the scandalous thing that we do not deserve. But if our human flesh is so built up with pride that we won't even repent and surrender to Christ in the first place as our Savior, the scandalous grace doesn't go with that. There's two sides of the same coin here. We have to humble ourselves before a holy God and acknowledge you are the creator, you're holy. Your son came and walked a holy life and was resurrected from the dead through his own power and I am woefully incapable of being righteous. And I need Him to be my righteousness. That's humbling. It's the ultimate humbling. But when we humble ourselves in that sense and in that way, we receive that grace and mercy and love and that peace that surpasses all understanding that we don't deserve in the first place. We don't deserve it even if we do repent, but God grants it anyway. The offense of the gospel comes from the fact that the basis of our need to be saved comes from that we are all dead. There is no ladder to climb, and if there was, dead people don't climb ladders very well. We are incapable of reaching the holy standard that God has put before us. And just as David was confronted with his sins, even as he, in a way that we think is so foolish, he got so upset and he was talking just about himself, the Scriptures do the same thing for us. That if we're in our Scriptures daily, if we're understanding what's being said to us, we have no reason 
to have pride. We have no reason to be arrogant in our own self, in our own ability. Because the ability that Scripture says I have is nothing. I have the ability to lie there and be dead in my own sins. To be humbled before a holy God, to understand that just as David did this, the Scriptures, every jot, every tittle, every verse, every passage that speaks of sin and the depravity of it, the Scriptures scream back at me, you are that man. Every sin I see and get offended in an egregious way, why would this person do that? Why did they do this thing? Screams back at me, you are that person. You are the one doing that. The only problem is your flesh is so fed by it that you don't even realize your sin. You don't even realize the way that you're sinning against the holy God. And we're in desperate need of repentance because of that. The first words that we see of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, you know, the, the love and accepting God, is repent. You are wrong. Turn away from. Walk no longer in that direction. I'm running out of synonyms here. Hopefully we get it. Jesus is saying repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God is bursting on the scene in a mighty way. And if you're not willing to humble yourself before a holy God, you will not be part of that kingdom. And on the other side of that coin, the scandal of the gospel then is that God would choose to forgive a people so undeserving. That He would love those who were formerly His enemies and then adopt them to be part of His family. He not only calls us as masters call their slaves, but He says, come sit at my table because you're part of my family now too. I wouldn't... <laughs> think of doing that to someone who had hurt my, my family in such a way. If someone had, had, had decided to murder one of my children, I wouldn't think, you know what? I want to bring them to my table. I want to eat with them. I want to call them family. I want to treat them like a child. But that's quite literally what Jesus has done for us. You were not around 2,000 years ago. I don't know. Some of you might have been. I don't know. You did not physically hold the nail that pierced his hands and his feet. But spiritually, you absolutely did. Because you are that man. You are the reason he came to die. Yield. Bow down. Repent. No longer walk in the ways of the world, but walk in the light as people of the light. First John says, and this is how we know that we, we love Him. He echoes it in the book of John, in chapter 15 and in 14, if we obey His commands. He doesn't say this is how you get saved as you do good enough stuff. He says if you've been changed, if your heart has been touched by Jesus, the proof in the pudding for that is you will do what He says. Because you love Him. Because that's what it takes to have our heart changed. It's God radically changing it for us. Now, now one might say, what is so scandalous that God would forgive me? Aren't I worthy of forgiveness? And once again, I'll say, hey, where were you the last 30 minutes? But that grace is even more scandalous than that. In Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 1, Jesus says, for the kingdom of heaven, that thing he's saying, repent because it's coming, he says, is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again in about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand there idle all day? And they said, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour, it's about 5 p.m., each of them came and received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. 
And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I chose to give this to the last worker as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Father has no favoritism. When when we usually, as, as believers, get that big puffed up head, we say, well, that person, well, look what they are doing, what they have done. We get the Pharisee syndrome. Look how holy I am. But God's grace is scandalous, not just in the fact that we get it undeservedly, but that He gives it out freely at the 11th hour, at the 3rd hour, at the 4th hour, at the 5th hour. Whether you've been saved since you were 4 years old, or you were saved 4 minutes before your death. That's the scandal of God's grace. And then some would argue back, well, why not just wait till 4 minutes before my death? You do not understand the goodness of our God. You do not understand what a wasted life looks like. I've, I've had the, the beautiful privilege of, of being able to lead two people to Christ on their deathbed. It was a beautiful moment. And they spent the last couple hours of their life mourning over the fact that they could not serve their Savior mourning over the fact that they wasted their life. They'll be in the kingdom. They they were given their denarius. They were given their wage. But if we understand the grace and the mercy of our God, if if our heart has been changed, we cannot wait until the last hour of our life. We must respond. We must come to the one who's lived to die for us. It's when we stand in the place of David's sins sins are are heaped up on our shoulders behind our back where we can't see them in self-righteousness and pointing in disbelief that God would save someone that we are that man. Because we don't understand who our God is or the price that was paid to redeem us. It's by the grace of God alone that we are redeemed of Christ. I want to close with a passage that both points the, the perspective of God's desire for repentance, but also points to the fact that His will will be done and those who do not repent will face wrath. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some would count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any would perish, but that all should reach repentance. We go, oh, that's such a beautiful, flowery New Testament verse. He's patient with me. That's so sweet. The sweet, meek, and mild Jesus with hands held out and arms open. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved in the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness. Well, that passage has Jesus in boxing gloves. And it's the same Jesus. He's gracious and patient, and He wants all to repent. That's the only reason He doesn't wipe us off the face of the earth the second we sin against Him. He loves us enough that He's going to give us the granting us of the opportunity to repent and turn to Him and trust Him in faith and place our confidence in Him. But at the same time, no one understand. All of this will be consumed in fire. There's not a thing that you see with your eyes that will remain. And a day will come when judgment will be enacted. And all things that are done will be exposed just as David's sins are going to be fully exposed to the people as we continue on, double fold, very publicly. There will be a day when our sins are exposed. When all things are laid bare before a holy God. And if we do not take advantage of the Lord's patience and repent of our sins, you will have no advocate to stand next to you. You will face a holy God in the full burden of His wrath because you've sinned against Him. But if we repent... 
But if we admit I am not holy, I need someone else's holiness to cover me. I can't even reach the point of holiness. I can't even see it from where I'm at. I'm dead in my sins. Then when all things are consumed with fire, all sins are exposed and we stand before a holy God, Jesus stands in front of us and says, He has my righteousness. And in God's book, we're counted as holy, not because of what I've done, because of what Christ has done for me. Don't press the Lord's patience. Think, I'll get to that someday. Let me do this sin a couple more times, and then we'll get to it. No. Not only do you not know the day or the hour because He comes like a thief, but you don't know your day or hour. You may not have that time. I remember being a, a, a fit and virile 24-year-old, not even thinking about death. And some of you who know me and, and know my story, I got so close to death, my, my arms got singed from the fires of hell. I wasn't going to hell. It's okay. That's just a funny thing to say in a southern accent. But I, I, I never conceived that I would even possibly get that close to death at that early of an age. I was just reading on Facebook last night that there is a teenager who passed away in New Mexico. He probably had no idea when he got behind the wheel of that car that he was going to die. Probably didn't even cross his mind. Last thing from it, most, for most of us, we don't walk around thinking about, oh, standing under pianos on cranes going, oh, I wonder if I'll die. It just happens. We die. That's one thing that we do really well as a human race. 100% success rate. Do not test the Lord's patience. Repent and believe the gospel. Those are the first words of Jesus in the gospel of Matthew and the last words of Jesus in the gospel of Matthew. For those of us who have repented and believed is go, therefore, teaching them all that he's commanded because he has all authority and he is with us always. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for, for what you've done for us, for the repentance that, that you accept freely from us. Holy Spirit, thank you for, for leaning our hearts towards those things, for reminding us when we're stubborn and stiff-necked and don't want correction to, to open up the eyes of our hearts to show us that we need it. We desperately need it all of the time. Lord, help us to walk in a posture of repentance that, that we would be, uh, it's just a part of who we are. We repent when we sin. In your word, it says that, that those who, who love him follow his commandments, but also in the very same chapter says, if we sin, we have an advocate. That advocate is Jesus Christ. And when we repent, he stands for us and beside us. And he gives us that righteousness and that holiness. And he takes my sin, an equation that I am nowhere in the part of, except for the fact that I need that righteousness. Thank you for being such a good God that you would do that. A God as holy as you doesn't have to be so merciful. But Lord, a God that is as merciful as you are, you are also holy. And you have a standard that we've all failed to reach. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And Lord, if there are people who, who, who understand that, who, who know that they've fallen short, I ask that you would help to, to come into their heart, to soften it, that you'd regenerate them and you'd give them the opportunity to repent. That they would not press your patience that they would come to you and surrender it all to you, Lord.